Brothers and sisters, the scripture reading today is from Matthew's telling of the encounter between the Roman governor Pontius Pilate and Jesus at Jesus' trial. I invite you to stand for the reading of the gospel. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people conferred together against Jesus in order to bring about his death. They bound him, led him away, and handed him over to Pilate, the governor. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You say so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many accusations they make against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the festival of the governor, now at the festival, the governor was accustomed to release a prisoner for the crowd, anyone whom they wanted. At that time, they had a notorious prisoner called Jesus Barabbas. So after they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he realized that it was out of jealousy that they had handed him over. While he, Pilate, was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that innocent man, for today I have suffered a great deal because of a dream about him. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowds to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus killed. The governor again said to them, Which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas! Pilate said to them, Then what should I do with Jesus who is called the Messiah? All of them said, Let him be crucified. Then he asked, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he could do nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took some water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. Then the people as a whole answered, His blood be on us and on our children. So he released Barabbas for them, and after flogging Jesus, Jesus hand, he handed him over to be crucified. This is the word of God for all God's people. Be to God. Amen. Please be seated. Each week, these three Sundays, last Sundays of Lent, we're hearing one song from Jesus Christ Superstar. And this morning, it is the uh, short song of Pilate's dream. Now, in Jesus Christ Superstar, Pilate is describing his own dream. Well, in the scripture, it wasn't Pilate's dream. It was his wife's dream, right? But the text goes like this. I dreamed I met a Galilean, a most amazing man. He had that look you very rarely find. The haunting, hunted kind. I asked him to say what had happened, how it all began. I asked again. He never said a word, as if he hadn't heard. And next, the room was full of wild and angry men. They seemed to hate this man. They fell on him, and then they disappeared again. Then I saw thousands of millions crying for this man. And then I heard them mentioning my name and leaving me the blame. The question that I invite you to consider as we move through this message this morning, is what appears to be Pilate's ultimate concern. 
Why does he make the decision he makes? How does he come to that decision? Pilate was a ruler living in a violent part of the Roman Empire. The Jewish natives were largely under the Roman thumb, but Jewish insurgents, that's what they would have been to the Romans, Jewish insurgents created repeated problems, and Pontius Pilate must collaborate with the Jewish leaders to keep a lid on the violence and maintain the kind of control that empires want to maintain. Did the historical Pilate regret his acts of violence on the battlefield or as a ruler? We don't know, but we do know that a few years later he was recalled to Rome for the massacre of a bunch of Samaritans where he had to defend himself. And it is not certain, but generally believed, that his life ended with his own suicide. It's not clear whether it was his choice or whether he was instructed to kill himself by the Emperor Caligula. Pontius Pilate must decide where to put his priorities. In the various gospel readings, he seems a little bit uncertain, a little bit confused. In the Matthew reading, he has his wife saying what? Find that man innocent. Do not hurt him. But I would suggest to you that his ultimate concern in the decision that he makes is the Roman Empire. Amen? That is the basis, the protection of the Roman Empire is the basis of his judgment, which brings violence and execution to, to Jesus. This, for the last several weeks and a few more weeks, we are going to be, uh, we are focusing on the book Soul Repair, which you have in your sermon supplement. And the focus of Soul Repair is the concept of moral injury, and that in the context of war is what I want to talk about this morning. I'm going to try to be as succinct as I can. I know we're going to run over a little bit, so I invite you to continue to breathe deeply, and I ask for your patience, brothers and sisters, okay? On your sermon supplement, you have the definitions of PTSD and moral injury. All of us have heard of PTSD, but not all of us have heard of moral injury. You can read the definition there, and the difference between the two, and by the way, veterans may have one, may have or another, or both. PTSD has identifiable symptoms of trauma. Moral injury is a complex wound of the soul that involves one's spirit, and in the discussion of moral injury, takes us to ethics and discussions of war. Moral injury is regarded as a wound of war. Moral injury gives a name to the guilt and remorse that troops often feel when they see or do the things they have to do during war. And the term applies both to soldiers, and this is important, it applies both to soldiers, our own combat troops, let us say, and also to the designated enemy, to any non-combatants in the region, to mothers, children, men who are not involved. So moral injury can damage anyone who is in the context of the armed conflict. Soul Repair shares, I want to just read the chapter titles to you because it will give you a sense of what the book focuses on. And really, if you have people in your life who are veterans, I recommend this book to you. It will give insights that you probably don't have if you haven't read it. The first chapter is, I Became a Soldier. The book traces primarily in, in uh, narrative, in stories, four particular uh, veterans. There are actually more people, but four primary. First chapter, I became a soldier. Second chapter, killing changes you. Third chapter, coming home is hell. 
Fourth chapter, I will live with moral injury the rest of my life. And chapter five, soul repair. After World War II, the Army historian General Marshall commissioned a, a, an official study. 1947 was when it, the results were announced. And this study found something that is surprising, I think, to most of us. It found that soldiers, well, this piece may not be, but the statistics, it found that soldiers possess a deep inhibition about taking human life. Now, that may not be so surprising, but the statistics were that in World War II, as, the, as they processed the data, 75% of combat soldiers did not fire directly at the enemy even when their own lives were at risk. Now, many of us in class were shocked to hear that. So obviously, the Army had real concerns about this in the training of soldiers, how to make them effective, and it developed a strategy for training which is called reflexive fire training, which conditions soldiers to shoot before thinking. There's a target, I shoot it. Whoop, there's a target, I shoot it. Whoop, there's a target, I shoot it. I do not go through my any kind of logical processing of my brain. Reflexive fire training was very effective as a strategy getting soldiers to shoot. And shooting rates rose to 50, 60 percent in Korea, 85 to 90 percent in Vietnam. Reflexive fire training helps the soldier, trains the soldier to bypass moral decision-making process which inhibits human beings from killing one another. So what does happen after a person kills another? Well, the responses are not all the same, absolutely. But in Soul Repair, the soldiers report that there was no training that prepared them for the deeper emotional and spiritual consequences of killing. Rather, boot camp training works to strip societal inhibitions against killing and transform the men and women who are at boot camp being trained into competent soldiers, which also includes being competent killers. Military training seldom offers resources for dealing with the price troops may pay for participating in the violence of active combat. Well, we can understand why. Trainees need to be taught to do the job they are being sent to do. But that means they are usually totally unprepared for what the damage may be to their souls that they will experience in the doing of it. At boot camp, and in the movie Soldiers of Conscience, which we are invited to, we will show in April, one of the many slogans that the troops use in training is the slogan, kill, kill, kill without mercy. If we understand the nature of war, and that's the other piece I want to talk about, then not dealing with the price paid by veteran souls is to be expected. I suggest to you it is part of the nature of getting people to go to war. They must be trained to be effective soldiers. If there is something that makes them reluctant to kill, if the training introduces doubt or nurtures their reluctance or their questioning, the training will be less effective. The country is training them to be effective at their job. And any empathy they, most, they happen to express will be focused within their combat unit, certainly not toward the enemy. Now, I'm sure that almost all of us here, those of us who have been vets and the majority of us who have not, have had experience with returning vets. And some of us may feel we were effective in giving support. Some of us may feel we weren't. All kinds of 
experiences are possible. But I want to talk for a moment about war and the relationship of our understanding of God and country. And what this does, not only to our active combatants, but what it does to us as a society. Rhetoric is essential to war. In order to send men and women into combat, the country's rhetoric, and by the way, I'm not speaking only of countries here. I could be speaking about tribes in Rwanda. I could be speaking about fascist Germany. I could be speaking about ethnic groups and the Bosnian War. Whether it is country, ethnic group, tribe, what happens usually is that the rhetoric collapses the will of God into the will of country. God and country, how often do we hear them together? And how much do we want to believe they coincide? Amen? We want to believe our country is doing God's will. If people can be convinced or assume that God is on our side, then we will be easily manipulated to wreak destruction and havoc on those named as the enemy. If we understand God and country to be one, it will be possible to motivate us to kill those often regarded to be demonic others and to understand that killing as, if not entirely innocent, at least acceptable because necessary. And ethics and discernment of God's will is largely out of the picture entirely. It is what, or it brings us to what the philosopher, German philosopher, referred to as nihilistic relativism when she wrote about Nazi Germany shortly after World War II. And I want to give a couple examples. Some German historians, not all, painted the crimes of Stalin as equivalent to the crimes of Hitler. Now, I'm not making a case. I happen to believe that Hitler's crimes were more serious, but that's not the point. The point is that by pointing to all the crimes, the horrendous crimes of, of Stalin, the German hips historians absolved the Germans of responsibility for all, after all, were guilty. After all, war is hell, right? The Bosnian War of the 1990s. Much has been written detailing the atrocities in that war. Most human rights monitors attribute at least 80% of the war crimes to the Serbian forces. And yet, Serbian writers and leaders developed a rich mythology of their own victimhood to justify their efforts to create greater Serbia. Chris Hedges, in his book, um, talks about a film that was produced soon after the end of the Bosnian War by the Serbians in Serbian, the title of which was Pretty Villages, Pretty Flames. And for the first time, media leaders in Serbia described qualities of Serbian militiamen. They described them, they showed images of them, burning Muslim villages, killing elderly citizens, carting away truckloads of loot. It was a version of the Bosnian War that most Serbians, the ordinary Serbian, had never, ever heard before. Bosnian Serb fighters were portrayed as petty criminals, thugs, and drug addicts. And one of the things about war that happens is that people who are violent by nature, or sociopaths, whatever it may be, who in a stable society tend to be marginalized and not empowered, in a time of war become empowered because they are the ones for whom it is easier to kill, kill, kill without mercy because they lack the quality of empathy. So the film showed a reality that was shocking to many of the Serbians who were still sitting in coffee houses saying, well, I don't really think we bombed Sarajevo. But that's not all the movie did. Who would have gone to see it if it had? 
Then the movie went on to show the atrocities of everybody else, even the Western forces who intervened. Not just the Serbian nationalist leaders, but it went on to say that one cause was just as rotten as the next. The Serbs had been manipulated, but so had the Muslims, so had the Croats. So by the end of the film, everybody had been brought down to the same depraved level. When the rhetoric does this, it does not do it to encourage everybody to repent, brothers and sisters. It does it to absolve people of guilt and the need for repentance. Can I have an amen? It is the nature of war. The collapse of God into country or God into ethnic group or God into tribe may be necessary to perpetrate effective murder of one another. The vast majority of us human beings do not kill easily. But if God has created you and me for love and for care of one another, if that is at the heart of how we are created, if that is our basic nature, if that nature is a part of whatever this part of ourselves we call soul is, then only in a kind of discipleship and having a sense of how God is working with us and leading us will we have the strength, the awakeness, not to be spun by rhetoric which assumes that our country is doing God's work. If we keep listening and we keep looking and we keep feeling for how God is guiding us, even as we hope God is working through our country, but being awake to the possibility that that is not the case, if we can do this, we will be able to distinguish our patriotism from idolatry. If we are blind and always assume that God is on our side, brothers and sisters, we will not be able to know, to discern, whether the choices of our country are genuine or whether we are worshiping our country rather than God in supporting them. I do not say it is easy. It not only takes discernment, it takes incredible courage to be the one to stand against the country. Jesus in John's gospel promised that the truth will set us free, and he meant God's truth as found in him with all that following Jesus entails, all that it entails. Jesus did not say discerning the truth would be easy, amen? But Jesus did also not say that finding that I will find my truth in the truth of my country or in my ethnic group. That is not what he told us. I suggest to you that now as we begin to talk about moral injury, well, one of the thoughts that came up was, why have we not spoken of it before? Well, it's been implicit in what I've said, but let me, let me say it in a simpler way. If we are created to care for one another, not to hurt one another, if that is the core of how God has made us, and our ability to hurt one another and to kill one another is inhibited by our nature, but soldiers, our military, the people who struggle to support the country as best they can, if our soldiers are trained to override this basic way we are created, then we might well expect that when they return from combat, all of that override as they move out of the place of adrenaline rush and having to be protecting their life and the life of their loved ones at every moment, that that kind of programming will break down. And suddenly the pieces of conscience will start coming up. I suggest to you that by having this conversation about moral injury, along with PTSD, we are taking a step in spiritual maturity in this country. We have not had that conversation before because it takes us into all kinds of consideration about the nature of war and what it does not only to combatants, but to you and me. 
But now, by the grace of God, this conversation is beginning to occur. And I pray our blessing on it. If soldiers come back with moral injury, they need more than the best meds. They need more than the most effective psychologist and counselor. They need support in dealing with those old spiritual religious terms such as guilt, remorse, forgiveness, and healing. And it is difficult to have those conversations, but if you will engage with soul repair, you will have a better sense of how to do it. What can we do? What can the church do? How can we support the experience of God's forgiveness and healing, at least to be awake to the need for it, not to treat it dismissively. The war for many soldiers who return, brothers and sisters, is not over. They are still living it, and that means the communities in which they live are still living it. The problem is not only theirs, but all of ours. May the Spirit of God in Jesus Christ lead us and heal them. Amen.